The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're now listening to Greg, it's the Brothers Wisp, let's take a ride through Hey everybody, space this, this is Greg with the Brothers Wisp, number 108. Um, today, we have a couple of, a uh, couple of, uh, I guess you guys are becoming regulars now, and one uh, missing Thomas. Finally, uh, he's got his sleep schedule sorted out, I guess. Uh, but uh, today we've got Mikey from Chicagoland. Hey. Hey. And then uh, we've got... Uh, T sent from Colorado land, right? Yep. All right. Yep. Are you northern Colorado? Yeah, northeastern. So out on the plains, middle of nowhere. Okay. Yep. Uh, I met a guy yesterday. Yesterday, named Shad, and he's from uh, northern Colorado. He said he's almost in Wyoming or whatever. So. Oh yeah. This is probably He'd be right in my neck of the woods. woods. Oh, there you go, rock and roll, man. Yeah. All right. So we actually have a couple of new patrons this go around. We have Jonathan Morrison and Richard Chalice. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I nailed that one. Totally. Uh, so why would you become a patron? Uh, one, it uh, helps us get to all of the lovely conferences that are going on right now. <laughs> buy, <laughs> buy new equipment and things like that. But it also gets you access to the patron-only Slack. And having said that, I installed the Mattermost, yeah, Mattermost server this morning. And so we tried to do an import, working out the kinks. It's super strange. Whenever you do the import, for whatever reason, it didn't want to keep everybody's email address. So it's like your the beginning of your email address at example.com. So I've got to <laughs> sort that. It might be easier just to not import anything and then just start from scratch uh, if it's going to do crazy stuff like that. But maybe we can do recent. Anyway, I digress. We're working on it. So I would say probably within the next couple of few weeks, we'll probably try and transition over to Mattermost, which will give us uh, infinite scalability. We'll uh, always have history going back. So uh, you won't have to, Mike won't have to ask the same, uh, where do you get your fiber vaults questions multiple times because uh, it will always be there in perpetuity <laughs> for good or for bad. Right. So I guess that's kind of uh, it's the curse of the internet. Whatever you say lives forever. So it's going to live forever in that matter most. Yeah. So now, now it's time to, for me to see if I can log in and, uh, go back and delete all my old sh posts. Yeah, I would say we kind of obviously we can't abandon the Slack just yet um, because no, not quite. the matter most probably isn't a hundred percent operational. But it's I think it's it seems pretty close. Well, I can't log in, so that's <laughs> uh, well. I'm yeah. I so I totally skipped the whole like using my own email, and uh, I just created a new account, and it's like ah, oh, I'm I mean, and it has stuff from years and years it's like wow it's everything's here i'm i'm oh, impressed really? that slack let everything come back oh really so like yeah from really really far back it's in there let's see uh beginnings of let's see i i know i've saw something all the way back in 2018 which is when i joined some of my oh, old posts wacky. there well you know what i because i i went through the slack console did the export of data mm -hmm. And I said all the way back to like October of 2018, maybe something like that. Yeah. And uh, I really didn't think it was going to pull all that stuff. So maybe the 10K limit that we have on the view, you can actually still export and get all of that. If that's the yeah. case, then we've got the stuff that goes all the way back. That would be pretty neato. Um, yeah. So there you go. All right. So we also have uh, a returning sponsor, Sonar. Uh, they are a scalable, intuitive, and comprehensive ISP billing and operational support system. Learn more at sonar.software. We also have a Sonar channel in the uh, Slack and the Mattermost, so you can pop in there, ask questions, and uh, I guess go back in the time machine and see everything everybody's ever asked about it. So that would be yeah. interesting. So, yeah, right now I'm, I'm still scrolling back, and I'm... I'm back. I'm way before our 10K limit in the Microtik channel, so I'm already in October of 2019. That's so, interesting. which you don't have access to anymore in the Slack. So, and I'm seeing my posts and everybody else's posts. So it's it's working. It's working really well. Oh, rock and roll, man! Uh, we've got uh, we've got searchable history in there then. Yeah. Cool. For better or worse. For better. <laughs> 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 yeah, I don't want to go through and clean all that stuff up. Uh, and you know what? The backup from Slack was only like 15 megs too. So 
What? Yeah. That was it. Text is it didn't tiny. It, it just all it pulls is text and links. It doesn't pull any files. So any of the oh. any of the screenshots or any of that stuff that people shared isn't going to be there. But everything else will be. Okay. Well, that's a little sad, but that's still pretty good. Yeah. Moving forward, it's going to retain all that stuff. Um, yeah. In perpetuity. So hopefully nobody puts anything too big in there. I think I've got enough storage. I follow their calculations to have enough storage space for this foreseeable future, like the next eight years or so. So. Uh, I really didn't want to mess with it for a while, but I also didn't want to like make it too tremendously huge and annoying. So we'll see. It, you know what the the interface looks really close to Slack. It just doesn't look quite as polished. So it it feels the same. Like uh, yeah, I could do colon thumbs up, and uh, you know it'll do the you know, thumbs up emoji and stuff. So it seems like everything is pretty much there. We just got to get Jiffy working, and then I'm set. It. Uh... Custom reactions. Oh, oh <laughs> yes. So you got to transfer all those over because they're so important. Yeah, I get the... Uh, I turned it on it? so uh, you guys can do The lighthouse stuff. on a hill. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The lighthouse at night, for sure. <laughs> and some of the other stuff. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about a couple of things. There's not a whole lot in the list. Um, I've been scrolling back. I mean... There was a lot of conversation back and forth, but not a lot of um, things where I actually, I just, sometimes I just get that thousand yard stare and I get tired of like reading whenever I, I try and aggregate some of this stuff. So there's, there's more that was in there and I just was bad about it. Uh, there was a lot in the COVID channel. I just couldn't bring myself to go in there because that's depressing, but there, there is some good stuff here and there. So I personally have started um, putting my playbooks and my Ansible playbooks, as well as my roles. So I'm converting a lot of the playbooks over to roles uh, in Ansible, which are kind of like a more modular, um, clean way of using those those uh, those in your uh, your own infrastructure. Right now, I've only converted the roles for router OS um, upgrades and firmware upgrades, but those are probably the two trickiest ones. So those are in there and available on my GitHub and I will continue to do the updates there and stuff. So jump over there and take a look if you guys are interested. In the course of that, I uh, Miller wanted to do like DSA keys on Microtix, the idea where you can, uh, you can log into them without actually having a username and password. It's kind of a public-private key that you use for SSH. And I went through the... Uh, I actually got it working. I think I'm not... Did I stop? I stopped somewhere. I got most of it working. I can't remember if I've completed it. No, I think I actually got it all working. All right, we're going to say I got it all working. But the Microtik documentation says make DSA keys, and that's a total uh, fabrication. You have to actually create them as RSA keys, and then they install fine. So just uh, for anybody out there that's going to do it the manual way. And I'll have that. I'll have those playbooks up in no time. I just uh, found that to be interesting that some of the documentation was old and annoying. I had to dig through the forums to find somebody who had uh, figured out what the answer was. Yeah. It, that's, that is a frustration sometimes when you're dealing with Microtix. Occasionally it's, it's changed and there's just a line and unless you follow all the changes in lines, you know, and you know this stuff, it's, you know, but that's, you know, why, why you have a, why you're getting paid to do your job it's to figure that stuff out, I guess. For huh. sure, for sure. Well, once somebody goes through and uh, it goes through the trouble of actually making a playbook and then they maintain that stuff, then it's always there. You could just grab it and you'll always have the most up-to-date way. You don't have to actually think of how it works. It's it's just it'll be there. So Yeah, yeah. super handy in that regards. Hopefully I can Appreciate. Uh, make that easier for everybody else. Make my life yeah. easier, make your life easier. Really, I've just been using this as a, a tool to um, learn my new job as quickly as possible. So <laughs> it's good for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Sure. No, and that sounds way better than my Microtip script, which was uh, just two reboots in a row with a, a uh, on a schedule to do updates in the middle of the night so that I don't have to be awake for it. Well, exactly. to be honest with you, if you look at the way I do the upgrade, it actually kind of does that. Uh, <laughs> because Ansible... <laughs> It doesn't do interactive prompts. Like, so when you SSH mm -hmm. to a microtick and you say reboot, it says, are you sure? You have to hit yes. Ansible doesn't handle that. So 
to kind of work around that, if a script actually calls it, then it will just reboot, right? If a script mm-hmm. in Microtech calls it. So it, I kind of create a quick scheduled entry and it puts it like, I don't know, like a minute in the future or something like that. And then says, you know, reboot. And then uh, it kind of takes care of itself after that. So, Oh, that makes me feel so much better about myself. <laughs> like, I was like, oh, because that's, that's exactly how I would go about to do it. Is I would upload the file, um, do a system reboot, and then system router board upgrade. Uh, that's delayed like five minutes so that the reboot, first reboot and upgrade happens. And then the second one hits and uh, does the upgrade and then it waits a minute for that to do its thing and then so and then I do another reboot and life's good that's and baller. usually when I wake up in the morning there isn't a bunch of stuff broken <laughs> I mean that's not that's usually. not too far off of what I'm doing here except yeah I have like a list of 150 micro ticks and uh, it will say you'll just tell it hey schedule it this time do a uh, do a router OS upgrade and so then it'll just plow just plot through each one of them. It'll do the upgrade. And then you say, okay, schedule 30 minutes later. It's um, firmware upgrade. And then it'll go through and just start. Ah, its that's through. beautiful. Yeah. So it's so. Uh, <laughs> it kind of makes it convenient. And then even then you could just pick out uh, various groups. So you can set up a group and say, hey, uh, call it like, I don't know, whatever the site is, Canary. And so it's just a handful that you're going to test it on. And you can have mm-hmm. it do that and then let it run for a week and make sure everything's okay and then you can blast on everything else if you want pretty convenient that's slick i'm gonna have to start learning me some ansible it, i'm about to this week this week's gonna be my last quiet week for a while and i'm gonna hammer out my presentation which is basically gonna be zero to 60 um using ansible on microtik stuff so really the presentation is going to be less than 30 minutes and it will give you everything you need to be up and like I think the Ansible install part takes about 40 seconds and then um, pulling your playbooks takes I don't know another minute and then uh, creating your host file will take you however long it takes you to put your devices in there and then you just tell it to run these things uh, they're already pre-built for you, uh, but it gives you examples on this is this is what they're doing inside. So you don't actually have to know all this stuff, but it shows you how it all works. And then when you look at it, it's really like pseudo coding, you know, like um, mm-hmm. if this thing happens, do this. But it's really just if you look at it, you're like, oh, it's just telling it run this microtech command, and oh, it's telling it run that one and that one. So it's it's really intuitive and simple. I like it. I am. Uh, jazz so it's gonna be my first one which is gonna be funny because I'm gonna put this out and then a year from now I'll be like I'll look at that and I'll say oh Jesus that was trash I can't believe I, I put that stuff out <laughs> and then I'll probably update it uh, which will be great so that it looks <laughs> less trashy yeah, yeah. I'm a kind of trashy guy so it sort of it's true to form you hey as long as it's it may be trashy but as long as it works that's the that's the key Oh, it'll work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's going to work, um, which I like. You know, and it's funny. Um, I'm still, I mean, I'm going to be working at Red Hat. I'll be on the Ansible. I guess our, well, I'll be on the Tiger team, which sounds baller, um, until uh, Tiger, Tiger Blood. King. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I'm Tiger King team. Uh, yeah. That thing is going crazy. The little bits and pieces of Tiger King I saw when I was walking through the living room, of my wife watching that, um, I think I got like almost like a contact high, but it was like contact uh, intelligence loss. It just just made me dumber just being in the proximity of that show. It's just it's, it makes me it makes me feel terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I don't know why it, people watch that for the same reason they watch, uh, you know, like videos of people getting injured, I guess. It's just, you, you like, you like the slow, it's like a slow motion. Have you ever seen two boats, like two giant boats crashing each other? You know what I mean? It's just, they're just, they're slowly crumpling 
you know, right in front of you. And it's just sort of hard to, I don't know. That's Tiger King for me. That it's like a dumpster full of dirty diapers on fire. It's just awful. I don't know how to describe it. It reminds me of the, um, uh, my, 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 uh, like the, the people who have like weddings, it's a, there's a TV series of people who get married to somebody just getting out of prison or still in prison and stuff. Oh, oh love I've after lockup. So you're talking about, yeah, there you go. It is love after lockup. <laughs> I, I have never even watched the show, but the just advertisements. Just I've never watched feel... it, but I've heard people talk about it who've watched it and it sounds awful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I just I had to think about it and it's just like oh just no, I can't. It's that reality. It's just it gets more and more grimy every year. Uh, makes That's me so uncomfortable. It makes me want to watch that kind of stuff like through my fingers, just covering <laughs> my face. It's like oh my god. It's terrible. I'm not please don't know. Oh yeah. Yep. Uh, uh, it's awful. So let's see what else is going on in the world. Somebody was asking about um, online platforms for schools. I guess their their local school is going to try and do something. And it seems like if you haven't already been doing some kind of online school thing, now it's going to be a really tough time for you to adopt it. I know our kids use Schoology. They've been using that here, like in our Bryant College mm-hmm. Station, in all the districts for, for quite a while. It's a little clunky. It looks ugly. And, man, have they been choking lately like just hasn't been loading content's not pulling my kid did like a ton of work and he's like trying to upload it and he's like it's just it's just not it's not doing anything it's just sitting there he's like i've been trying all day i was like all right well it's not much more we can do you know it's uh a platform you know i know another guy that um does uh i don't would you call it software as a service it's not really I mean, it's yeah. sort of like software as a service. And he said that they've been ordering servers by the pallet load, trying to keep up with demand that they've been seeing. All of a sudden, it's just everything's skyrocketing. Oh, yeah. No, it's... It, well, I mean, the, I think uh, Wispa was just talking about how, or for, like, most people were seeing a more than 35% increase in just raw traffic and that traffic's going somewhere and it has to come from somewhere yeah you know everybody's just getting hammered uh left and right um and you know the facebook groups we were just seeing all these people talking about like hey how do i do work for home stuff for people um you know vpns phone calls oh i bet the uh ethereal people are their their lives are probably glorious right now just for how much they're um, able to get as far as new people wanting to do phone stuff. It's got to be good or great. Who's uh, it's like it's I'm, I'm unfamiliar with Ethereal. Who are those guys? Um, I think that was actually one of the few interviews at Wispa Palooza that actually worked out. Um, <laughs> they yeah, um, they have a uh, white box phone service. Okay. So you, yeah, you. Basically, you can just sign up with them. They hook in and tell you how to connect people's phones to the network, and then everything just looks like it's your business. And then, they, but they take over and run everything for you in the background. And they can even do tech support and stuff like that for you too. Um, and they're based out of Colorado, if I recall correctly. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so they're they're actually over in my neck of the woods. I feel a little bit bad that my company's not going to them. Hey, but I didn't hear about them until after uh, we made the no decision. Worries. Mikey, your phone service, <laughs> is, that, is that all PSTN, or are you guys actually pulling SIP trunks over the internet? Um, Both. Okay. Um, So we've got, you know, our main switch is in the local CO that has, like, all the tandem and, you know, all the old traditional PSTN stuff. Um, But I'm not expanding that as, like, I'm not continuing down the uh, TDM road when right. I expand. <laughs> um, getting T1 costs, you know, point-to-point T1 costs to different tandems is just like, there's still hundreds of dollars, like, like I got a quote for a T1 to one of the other tandems, and it was more than my one gig wave into Chicago, and I'm like, I, no. 
I can't do this. <laughs> but I was just curious from like a uh, VoIP provider's perspective, what's service been like uh, pulling SIP trunks over the internet right now? Just as I'm pretty, I mean, so I've, I've been working from home for a really long time and I use sudden link here off of cable modem. And I've noticed some weird glitchy behavior in the last two weeks, you know, just services that are normally just there. You don't think about it, just kind of stuttering a little bit here every now and then. So I was just curious how people are, what their experiences are like for VoIP over the internet. Sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And like, well, and so then we do a lot of like VoIP facing our customers, uh, but then that's all, it's almost, that's mostly on our network. Yeah, on that. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, yeah, that's easy enough to handle. Um, one of the, one of the uh, customers uh, is a travel agency and they have people mostly in Chicagoland, but all over the country that work from home. And so they've got, you know, we've got Comcast and and Cox and Suddenlink and Mediacom and Frontier and AT and T, you know, all these things, and no one's complained yet. So that's good. So we must have good connectivity in Chicago, because yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure their networks are trash. Yeah, everybody's been seeing uh, a lot of increases, which I thought was interesting. So in the data center world, I'm not, I'm not looking at. Um, uh, my customers aren't eyeball networks, right? I'm not, I don't have a bunch of users and houses trying to just get to the internet. Most of them are hosted platforms, you know, or they are small cloud platforms or, you know, whatever it happens to be. It could be uh, a lot of people, uh, whether users come in via VPN or just, I mean, you know, it, it runs the, the gambit of all kinds of stuff. And uh, to be with, honest with you, I haven't seen the exponential growth that a lot of other people have having said that our houston network actually seems to have um have less throughput not by a lot but a little bit of less lower utilization kind of across all of my uh, transits there which is super weird i wouldn't i mean i really would have expected that one to go up however our brian location it has gone up probably 10 percent or better on utilization there. So um, Brian's more kind of a DR play. Almost none of the customers in the Brian College Station area actually, um, or actually most of the customers in the data center in Brian College Station aren't in Brian College Station. They're everywhere else, you know, close to the coast and Houston and all that stuff. So um, I guess they're really starting to try and activate some of those services. And we've seen some of our DR customers actually go ahead and preemptively declare they wanted to get their, um, their users out of Houston. So they're bringing them down here and uh, housing them uh, in hotels and stuff like that down here and having them work out of the DR area, at least some of the key employees. That's interesting. Yeah, um, yeah actually, you're, you're not the first person to mention that you've seen decreases in the Houston, Canada, sub Texas area. I was seeing somebody else on Facebook mentioning that as well. And I was like, hmm, that's really interesting. Greg mentioned that too. So it'd be really interesting to see uh, well, some if the, somebody's actually tracking that. Some of the correlations I noticed were, uh, well, you know, it's a lot of petroleum companies, right, in Houston and stuff like that. And if you're doing pipeline yeah. control, you're required by law to actually have uh, backup SCADA controls and consoles and stuff like that. And so we're seeing a lot of those guys get out of Houston because they're anticipating the whole city getting, like, hard locked down. And so it's going to be hard for their employees to actually make it to the control centers because they're just scattered to the winds. You know, they live everywhere. It's just, it's going to be problematic for them to get through. So if they go to a smaller, smaller place, uh, you know, where they have DR, then it's going to be a lot easier for those guys to go to and fro to actually hit those pipeline control centers and stuff. So it makes sense. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're shifting gears and pulling your utilization out of your primary and moving it to your backup, then I could see why those data centers would, you know, be less used. Of course, some of those customers, you know, we have seen utilization go up in Houston. Some of them are like um, uh, online medical hosting platforms and stuff like that. So people are just, you know, just, I mean, I guess the doctor's offices are going ham right now and people are just uh, trying to move more to that online telehealth stuff or whatever. So, mm. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, uh, um, I've heard that, uh, you know, people like Zoom and WebEx are just, just trying to scale out because their systems are just, you know, falling on their faces left and right. They gotta be. With, uh, oh, shit, yeah. Um, and so the PBX that we use, um, it has a web meeting component. Um, now you can set up your PBX wherever you want it on a Raspberry Pi, in the cloud, you know, on your own virtualization platform. Um, but the web meeting aspect historically has has been hosted somewhere. Like you can p- choose which, like you know, which location you prefer, but. It's not yours, uh, and so they were talking all up. Hey, you know, you know, adding new servers and this and that. But they've been talking a couple of years about how they were gonna make a local version. Like that would be handy right now, because everybody who's spinning up things in the cloud is running out of resources spinning things in the cloud because that's what everybody's doing. Hmm. Um. Whereas if I could do that on my own infrastructure, um, I've, I've got plenty of capacity. Yeah. Yeah. So long as most of that stuff stays on net, right? You're going to be good. Yeah. That, well, and then, you know, even if not, I mean, it's, it's still, you know, you know, we've got enough internet capacity too. Well, that's what uh, I was thinking about. I've got tons of overhead. Um, that's one of the things that I was so happy for um, was that I have so much extra capacity at the data center having said that um you know i am i've got was it like five more days and then i walk away from that place so i was you know i was glad i could at least give them that it's like in this time right now this is one thing you don't have to worry about but then i was thinking about you know what it doesn't matter how much capacity i have if, if those isps have oversold the hell out of it like you know isps do then when the time comes and i need it it may not be there so kind of double-edged sword we did see who was it uh, i think it was simon put up that um in Bork, and i'm unfamiliar with these guys it's a uk fiber-based provider they put out a, a notice to all their customers that they're suspending slas during the covid crisis so if there's a cut that's like brah we're getting to it when we can or if your service is down we're trying everything we can to to get there and and you know maintain that infrastructure and it's just it made me kind of think, you know, being in the, the data center world, that's that's one of the main reasons you go to a data center, right? One is connectivity options, and two is your SLA, your service level agreement, guaranteeing that you're still going to be up. And if all of your providers start dropping their SLAs to you, does that mean I get to drop my SLA to my customers? I'm pretty sure I don't, you know. Um, I guess, what do you call this, an act of God? Is that kind you of work a, harder? The center? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of tricky. Act of God level in that regard. I mean, but oof, I would hate to be the guy doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting on some of the Facebook groups seeing people comment about how all of this has been happening, and that their 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 pipe isn't full, but yet they're still experiencing things they can't explain. Yeah. And, of course, I come in with some snarky, you know, don't, you know, don't depend upon generic, you know, DIA. <laughs> and yes, yes, go so to the was this supposed yes, to mean? yes, yes. It, uh, well, yeah, but, like, you know, the less that's in your control, <coughs> the less that, you know, or the more likely that you're going to have problems like that. You know, when you're just depending on AT and T for all your connectivity, well, when AT and T fills up, you're full. Yeah, when you got a single uh-huh. provider, or if that guy's having a bad day. Um, uh, James was talking about how, because he was he was kind of filling me in on it, how uh, they were getting what is it a VPN tunnel like dropped at 10:30 at night, and they couldn't figure out what was going on and. Uh, they had assumed it was on the the other guy's side, and so they ended up getting up to the carrier. I don't know which carrier it was. <laughs> so they had everybody on the call with the tech trying to troubleshoot. And he was like, uh, 
have you figured out what the problem is yet? And he, I think the tech said, if I knew what the problem is, it would already be fixed. So <laughs> that guy is having a really bad day right now. Um, anyway, they rebooted a line card in the middle of the day, which is like, whoa, brother. That's uh, pretty crazy. As soon as they rebooted it, everything started working again. So uh, they were apparently having some major VoIP issues uh, going through that pop. And yeah, so it was a really bad day. And I think, I think he said that the guy on the phone was like, uh, uh, what were we up to before? And he goes, two terabits per second on that card. He goes, where are we at now? He goes, well, we're about two terabits per second. So I think it's, I don't think they were um, exactly prepared for the load they found themselves under. <laughs> so, I, you know, it's sure. You know, if, if that guy's saying that kind of stuff on the phone, they're probably having a really bad day. I'll be really bad. Uh, they're going to have a really bad month. It's, uh, well, like I think that's part of why I've seen a lot of mid-sized hosting companies. Um, you know, they may only have facilities in, say, Chicago, but they build a you know six-pop national network um, so that they can help kind of mitigate some of those issues where you know they they buy you know a transit port in you know Seattle, LA, Chicago, Dallas, Atlanta, New York and then they have their own waves connect everything together so that way it's well if Chicago is full or there's a problem in Chicago you know we'll just shut that down and pull it in from somewhere else instead, knowing that their wavelength isn't oversubscribed. Well, you know, I mean, I've played the internet plumber game long enough and, and I, I, you guys have too, probably at this point. Um, and probably most of the guys listening have at this point as well, but you know, it's, it's very much a trust relationship with your upstreams or your IXs with anybody you're pulling connectivity from, right? If you're, if you're transiting their network, you're, you're basically saying, Hey, please don't screw me over guy or gal or non-binary or whatever you happen to be. You know, it's like, I, I liken it to being on, uh, you're driving on a road, right? You're trusting that everybody else isn't going to swerve in your lane and crash into you. Right. And, and they trust that you're not going to do that. Stuff sometimes goes wrong. So imagine you've got six pops all over the country and, uh, Google's AS is preferred through a single one of them. And that single one has problems. Guess what you're going to have is a, a really bad day, right? <laughs> because if I've seen it before where a router will lock up, but it's still sending you routes and it's still advertising your routes out, but it's black holing everything that's moving through it. I've seen that more than once. I've seen links overloaded with congestion. And so you're still passing some traffic through there, but not enough or, you know, to actually, I mean, you're seeing like 40% packet loss on your network, but everything's still technically up and working. So it doesn't really matter how much you dilute it. You can, attempt to mitigate that stuff with dilution, like having enough upstreams where hopefully that router will do what it's supposed to do and just completely drop traffic. But when that doesn't happen, you're kind of shit out of luck. And uh, that's where forward looking systems have really saved my ass in the past uh, because they're constantly testing. And so when it sees Google go down, it'll pull that carrier out of the mix and shift everything to somebody else. So um, it's, it's not, it's not enough to just have dilution. I mean, I don't even know if dilution is the right word, but you know, enough upstreams to kind of share the load amongst multiple things. When somebody has a really bad day and something goes wrong where it can shift off of that, because I mean, I guess you could still do it manually, right? You could still try and detect where the problem is, do some traits routes, figure out who's having a problem and then try and shift traffic off. I mean, you could still do that manually, but how long is that going to take you to figure out? And if it's three in the morning and you get woke up, how much extra time is that going to take you to figure out? Yeah, uh, it, uh, it, uh, I, you know, I see that talked about back and forth uh, a lot on like Nanog, um, you know, using these automated, you know, quality influenced BGP management platforms, and um, you know, you see the people that see a problem and want to solve it and then you see you know 
super network engineer that, you know, he's the only, you know, I'm only going to do things manually. I'm always going to, you know, console into my my Cisco and, you know, pound away at the CLI, and I'm going to fix everything by hand. No, you're not. I mean, you might, but <laughs> your competitors aren't, and there's a reason for that. And you know what? Yeah, eventually, uh, I was going to say there's a decent bit of skill required to do that. Um, and you have to have enough cojones to uh, feel comfortable doing that stuff, right? So a lot of these guys listening probably only have two upstreams. What happens when they pick the wrong upstream, right? They're like, oh, this is the one with the problem. They try and move everything off, right? I, I'm assuming most of the guys listening to this don't, like we do in the data center world, give 100% SLA to customers, which means I don't get to pick the wrong one. You know, I can't jack around. And every second, I'm like, uh, you know, there's there's a calculated number of, of dollars that I'm losing. So um, no human can do it nearly as quickly as uh, a machine can. Now, are they infallible? Uh, nope. Because they're made by man, right? So anything we make sure. is inherently flawed. <laughs> but is it sure. um, consistently better at uh, finding the problem and rooting it out? Oh, yeah. It is like... Uh, it's helped me sleep so many times and it's helped me avoid disaster over the last, I don't know, seven years, uh, a multitude of, has it been seven years? I don't know. It's been a really long time. It feels like a really long time that I've had it in place. And, uh, it's, uh, it's really nice. Now, can I imagine like the big boys doing it? Not necessarily, but I can imagine the middleman, you know, like people like us using it fairly effectively. Uh, yeah. It's uh well, I, I could see the big boys, um, you know, someone like, you know, NTT or, or, you know, like that scale, uh, developing it themselves, you know, not, you're not going out and buying a noxion box or, you know, whoever makes the box today, but they have their, you know, they're already doing extensive testing of things themselves. Um, you know, and I could see them putting some sort of, you know, if then logic into a script and and um, you know managing it internally. I know <clears throat> too. Uh, well, for one, I know Nick Braulio screaming uh, at his phone right now when he's listening to this uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, he doesn't. Um, you know, he doesn't subscribe to manipulating routes artificially. He's not a big fan of that. Um, and I don't know how I would feel about that in the middle of a big carrier network, you know, <laughs> them artificially manipulating routes and stuff like that. But as an end customer, you know, or kind of a data center provider like that, I feel a lot better about it. <laughs> oh yeah. Just cause I know well, how, how much better it's made my life. Yeah. The guy who's not here. He, he has said, um, at least when I've, I've talked to him, you know, it, for inside of your own network, do whatever the heck you need to, to make sure that the network stays up. Um, and I mean, I think he would may more mainly be against affecting routes that you're passing through to somebody else, because then you're you are taking data away from other people that they can use to make a a good decision. Um, so. And at least and maybe that's not the way he would exactly put it, but I mean, God, I don't think you, I, I know I don't see any problem. Like for my personal, like the traffic coming out of my network, I'm, I'm going to direct it one way or another just because I mean, not all of my routes are symmetrical even like I can't have the preferred route going across my hundred meg connection because, well, I only have a hundred megs of that and that can only be, very special stuff so you know that's that's at least in my opinion like if it's inside your network just do it like it you, you're you're already going to be doing it just by um <clears throat> if you have multiple edge routers and just deciding which router gets the traffic first um because that that router is going to prefer its stuff that's connected to it over anything else if everything else is equal mm -hmm. you know something, and, something else that kind of um I mean, there's there's a lot of things that sort of feed into this and off of this. And one is a lot of the 
well, um, a lot of the streaming services have cut down their bit rate, right? So uh, was mm-hmm. it like Netflix, I think, cut down? And uh, I think YouTube is going to like standard def, but you have the option to go back to high def if you just click it or whatever. But I've also noticed that, well, to me, that, that makes sense. And I think that will help things uh, tremendously by uh, lowering the stream quality. But I've also noticed that uh, game services now are saying that they're slowing down uh, downloads. So you can't download as at at high, as yeah, high uh, rate of speed, right? Yeah, I've seen uh, PlayStation uh, say that, and I've seen uh, uh, Akamai, you know, on their CDN. You know, they're trying to control some of that stuff. You know what I I found interesting though is I think the streaming video. I think that's I think cutting down quality will help everybody. Um, but I think slowing down game services, I was thinking about this in the terms of a wisp, but you guys are, are better equipped to, to talk about this than I am. I don't know that that necessarily helps a wisp. So say this wisp, say you're a wisp, say you've got a gig coming in and your users are using 800 megabits, right? So your pipe's not full, so you have no problems. If they suddenly slow down all the game streaming services, now instead of this one guy downloading a game for six hours, he's downloading it for 24 hours straight. So multiply that by all of your users that are doing that, which means there's a ton of people consuming airtime on your radios that they wouldn't have been before. So now there's contention. There's, um, you know, there's fewer people that can talk simultaneously, but it's just the nature of Wi-Fi. So would it actually make it worse for your wireless network for gaming services to slow this stuff down if, you're, if your overall pipe isn't already full? It... it um it's a different question, but a similar answer to what uh, I said in one of the uh, mm-hmm. Nanog threads. Um, that the the problem traffic or the traffic that's being modified to be more accommodating um, isn't the only traffic on the pipe. Right. Um, you know, if you're if there's a microburst of, you know, you know, say your your 800 megs becomes 900 megs for 30 seconds for whatever reason, uh, for 30 seconds you have bad phone calls, you have bad video conferences, you have you know everything goes to crap for a little bit, but then it comes back, and your five minute average still only showed 800 meg. Um, a lot of these services that were ramping up the usage of now because of work from home and tele whatever are very uh very delicate um you know any any problem along the way and they're gonna fall on their face whereas an an ftp download an http download a netflix stream it falls on its face it just it recovers and it 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 doesn't matter uh that it fell on its face um, and so actually one of the one of the important people at the network who was being talked about on Nanog when I, I made that sort of comment but publicly uh, they responded privately and said like in all caps thank you because like they're trying to say you know we're not the only thing on your pipe and you know we can handle it but they can't Hmm. Uh, and so what you're getting into greg also is kind of theory in bandwidth limiting and um how to get people good service um or like service that feels really good um one thing i would say is like as far as game download stuff nobody in my network is really going to notice a the you know steam or Band, maximum bandwidth that you can up download your game to to what I, what are they limiting it to 25 50 meg whatever I I, I don't know but um, most of my customers are not even at that speed right and even if they are their uh, Xboxes are on a crappy Wi-Fi connection so they're just never gonna notice right. <laughs> the difference um, so in that regards 
it's not going to be a significantly huge beneficial factor for WISPs in that the guy who is going to be downloading for eight hours is still going to be downloading for eight hours because the the limiting factor wasn't his wasn't how fast the internet gotcha. was it was how fast you're delivering the internet gotcha. to him um but in general yeah um you do you're gonna have more of that um a user taking up time on your access point and yes you really do a lot of the times if you have the available bandwidth it's better to slam it down and get that person whatever they're requesting and get that data to them so that your access point can forget about them and move on to the next request as fast as possible and that will help you increase your overall throughput and secondarily just make people feel like your internet's way better so that's why most um, like bandwidth limiting systems have a bursting option and wherein they will allow somebody to go above their um, you know rate limited speed for a period of time um, just so that you get a little bit snappier and you can you know it feels better to them and it gets them off of your network and trying to do stuff so it's not only for access points but you know your router has to keep track of every single connection that's open and trying to do stuff especially if you're natting so you know it's less um, less stress on your infrastructure, um, hopefully. Yeah, I know. That's the idea there. In the high density game, whenever I was playing that for a minute, uh, we put no rate limits on users, right? So the idea was let's get them, let's get them off the wire as absolutely fast as we possibly can. Let's let them pull whatever is they're gonna pull and then shut up, just because there was so much interference in there. Because I mean, you've got, I don't know. 18,000 fans in there you're expecting half of them to be on the wi-fi it is a noisy environment and then oh by the way let's put a big salad bowl on top so we can reflect all the rf back around we got a big thunder dome for wi-fi is basically what it was um so yeah i just it, i always i know it's a different animal uh when you're mm -hmm. doing fixed based wireless outdoor but i always that kind of stuff would just got burned into my brain and so i always think about that sort of thing yeah, no, and if you can't, like, I know um, back when I was on the DSL reports forums a lot, they had, um, I can't remember what his name was, but he was really pop famous in the Ubiquity forums for a really long time. But um, uh, he talked about actually how he just had a single plan for his customers, and that was just an internet connection plan, and then they got whatever he could deliver to them at whatever point in time he didn't do have different speeds which was a really cool idea I don't know how you would explain that and have customer education but in in general as long as you had you know didn't have somebody who was a huge bandwidth hog you could probably do a lot of really cool stuff with that but bandwidth hogs ruin it for everybody that sounds like a bunch of hippie stuff to me yeah it, um, <laughs> free range it, uh, wi one at uh I guess one one problem with the um you know get them on and off as fast as you can opposed to slowing them down is that makes sense if you have a one gigabyte file that needs to be transferred you mm -hmm. know I you know I don't know if it actually makes a difference or not but I if you told me that Okay, but if you're streaming Netflix, you know, or let's say Disney Plus because it's worse, you know, uh, Disney Plus at 4K, you know, you're chewing 40, 40 some megs a second, um, whereas on a standard 1080, uh, you know, Netflix is only five. And so, if you know, so like you know, if you gave them more speed, they're gonna the the server ramps up to a higher bit rate because it's available. So there's more bits flying. And did the customer really gain anything? No, they really didn't. But they consumed 
four times, ten times the number, you know, the mud traffic on the network. Yeah, I mean, and that's then your the where you have to make the debate and make the decision of like, okay, how are you going to to do this in such a way? Because yeah, I mean, there's plenty of people who, you know, they're going to be watching. Uh, you know, they don't need to get a 1080 or or 4K stream to their 1080p TV mon or TV screen, but the Roku just does. I mean, actually, I, I'm not certain. I'm not going to throw. I'm just going to throw Roku under the bus here because uh, I've interacted with their products a lot, <laughs> but I don't. Not going to say they actually do it, but um, I know I've seen products that will say, "Oh, this is a you know 4K." TV monitor or whatever I can display whatever you give to me and Netflix just starts pushing it down and it was like this 720p naive just horrible junky TV screen and it's like pull, trying to pull uh, like 50 megs just to watch um, a Netflix show and it's like what the heck is going on and when we finally tuned that down and said nope force it to this things worked really well for that customer um, through the and I don't even remember what the device, but it was a Roku-esque device that was just be trying, being really, really junky on that. Um, so yeah, if, if you can, that there, that is true. You know, if you're uh, running into that, but okay, you know, th there's going to be people who are going to abuse the system one way or another. Uh, which way do you want to go? Which what do you what do you like to support? Would be the ended question. Which is your favorite kind of abuse? <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you like to be abused? What's your favorite way? Pick your poison. Uh, good times. <laughs> oh, man. So what else happened this week? There was, um, this hit me. I don't know how many, probably nobody else on here was affected, but um, the DNSSEC look on the side, uh, auto key expiration happened. So there's, and I'm going to totally butcher this, but there's like these DLV records that were in place kind of temporarily while DNS, uh, DNSSEC infrastructure was put in place. Uh, you could do kind of like these, I think it, I think it had to do with like um, domains and subdomains, like not all the parts would actually be secured with DNSSEC. And so this was kind of a, um, a bridge to kind of, you know, until everything could be taken care of. Anyway, the look aside was uh, rendered moot back in September of 2017 uh, with the signing of the roots and all that stuff. But it was still put in place. It was still there. And a lot of people's, uh, by nine implementations still looked at, for those records. And so as soon as those jokers expired, two of my DNS servers just immediately poof, just stopped doing any resolution of any kind. I was like, oh, no, sorry. Uh, so it took me a hot minute to figure out what was going on. And then I turned off DNSSEC, uh, which is not ideal, but resolution started happening again. Uh, you know, at resolvers, that is. And then uh, John was kind enough to point out on the, uh, I think the Nanog list, that uh, some other people had noticed it and somebody from uh, <laughs> dlv.isc.org said uh, apparently we let our signatures expire we're fixing it now we apologize for this <laughs> this was this was an accident we did not do this on purpose but then they went on to say you shouldn't be using this anyway so go turn it off <laughs> which I had already done at this point but yeah I said that was funny it's just like oops we uh made a mistake and we let our, our, our certificates expire. Sorry about that. Uh, I wonder how much of the internet that broke really quickly because uh, it broke a little chunk for it, me. <laughs> it, uh, it, uh, I saw it uh, about the same time. Like I didn't put two and two together right away because I was kind of ignoring the list. But it came through about the same time that you were posted in Slack. I saw it come through Nanog and on uh, the bind user list. You know, people... What's going on? Yeah. So, okay. I wasn't the only one that noticed it, evidently. Uh, <laughs> if you had more than just those two DNS servers configured, you were okay. But if you were just using those two, man, you had a bad time. So that was, uh, that was a fun one. I thought Friday was going to be quiet. Nothing since the moment I put in my two weeks notice, I have not had like a quiet moment. Like if I'm not documenting something, something's blowing up. It's just, it's, Oh man, it's punishing me. It's punishing me on the way out the door. <laughs> but hopefully everything will be quiet uh, very soon. I'm anticipating a quiet next week. Uh, there's not a whole lot of it left. I have to work. So, uh, and, and congratulations. I, told him, I said, tell me everything you need now because I don't know how much you're getting out of me next week. <laughs> 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 oh man. Speaking of DNS, 
Nick Braulio is doing, um, I guess you would call it a crowdsource, community source DNS testing initiative. So uh, he's got uh, some quick, uh, what is it? I guess some quick instructions up on dns.qosbox.com. And you can paste that in, I think, into a Ubuntu server. I think he's got instructions for a couple of different ones. And then I think you email in the keys you generate and uh, you get thrown into his smoke ping instance. So he's got stuff from all over the world just kind of keeping tabs on how the DNS resolvers are doing at the moment. It, uh, actually, that's it's, uh, as my head's been turned away from the camera, uh, one of my three networks I have boxes on wasn't reporting correctly. And so I've been trying to figure out why that wasn't reporting uh, data to Nick correctly. Yeah, it's still a work in progress. Um, he's just gotten it up not too long yeah. ago, so should uh, produce. Some and he's uh, making it look, yeah, he's making it look way cleaner now too, and really cool info. Um, you can see, yeah, everybody in the Wit Slack group who's been doing it, and yeah, he's going across um, to. How many is this? One, two, twelve, fifteen odd different um, public DNS providers, um, and it's really cool information. And really, just you know, I don't know what the benefit is going to be for the the world um, for this info, but it's definitely going to be something of note, usable by somebody I to think, say, "Hey, this is broken." There's tons of people I think that are really uh, curious about the data that's going to come out of all this COVID stuff. And this is just going to be another really interesting point. Um, you know, you're going to be able to cross reference this with everything else. I think it's in the end, I, I was telling somebody the other day that just how beautiful I think data is. And uh, especially all this stuff that we've been pulling together now, uh, you know, now that we're seeing all these spikes and you just see everybody posting their graphs and stuff like that. It's just, it's going to be interesting to see what somebody does with all this data once they aggregate it together. Yeah, definitely super, super interesting. More data, it's always good. Yeah, I think the... If you run a network or have access through someplace uh, to the internet, feel free to set it up. I think Nick would love to get more people. I think he's looking for us... Australia now and Africa, I think. Asia, yeah, Africa. It uh, pretty much anywhere other than the U.S. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I was gonna say I could but, drop a node, but I think he's he's probably got plenty here in uh, in the it, states. But I don't know. It um well, I think he'll wants a node wherever you can get a node, but he really wants them um, other places. And the the more remote or odd the location, the better. So, like, if if you've got a node on some, you know, Pacific island, um, you know, he wants something there. <laughs> Somebody in Hawaii. Well, no, like, 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 not even Hawaii. Like, some, you know, American Samoa or Fiji or like, you know, one Welcome. of those tiny things or, or you know maybe something that only has a satellite connection you know just you know just to yeah i mean yeah there's to see like um puerto rico jamaica you know all those island nations that'd be cool all right let's see what else uh while we're talking about it i think somebody mentioned vpns um Obviously, I've had to slap up a few VPNs really quickly. I'm sure everybody listening to this has had to slap up some. Um, I put up one. So we've got an ASA that's doing VPN concentration. Uh, well, I mean, it's acting as a firewall, you know, number one. But it's sitting at, mm, it averages about 70% CPU load. And so the company has, I don't know, 150 employees that they're probably going to all just snap their fingers and move to remote if they haven't already. And I was thinking, oh, I don't know if we should chance that. So we went ahead and set up a MicroTik to be a VPN. And somebody else was asking about two-factor authentication for VPN. And the way we do it is through uh, Radius server. So whenever the users log in, it makes a Radius call back to a server that's doing the two-factor authentication interaction with some other service, you know, that will text you or, or whatever it is. I don't know. Um, but I noticed in our ASAs, I think we had the timeout for the radius messages at like three minutes. 
right? Because sometimes it takes the two factor stuff a little bit of time to, to get out there into the user or whatever, but MicroTick only lets you set that to a max of one minute. So I was thinking that's probably okay during normal times, but now I'm assuming those two factor companies are probably under additional load, which means their service is probably going to be just a little bit slower. So hopefully everything <laughs> works out. People might have to take a couple of swings at it. Um, I'm not sure. I wish they would allow you to kind of increase that timer a bit more, but you know, there's not much I can do about that. Speaking of VPNs, um, this is just a, a plea to go out to all those people who manage uh, laptops or computers that could be taken home to somebody's home internet and then may start stop working because of one reason or another. Um, particularly if you hard set the DNS to your internal business DNS IPs, that's a huge pain in the neck to have to diagnose like okay why is this not working and then <laughs> secondarily what you, I've had to do is hijack any of those connections send them over to my DNS server so that your customers your employee laptop is able to do the DNS lookup back to your VPN and then connect back to your VPN and then it'll pl play, be happy but until that point the customer doesn't have internet and they can't connect to the VPN and it looks like m it's my stuff's broken and it doesn't look like your stuff's broken. So stop that. How many of those have you run into so far? Um, this week was, there was two people, but I've luckily months and months and months ago, I had this one customer who just kept on having it would work, he, and the, the telltale thing is it would work when he was at his hotel, but he, it wouldn't work when he was back at my, uh, using my internet. Hmm. And I was like, what the heck is going on here? And so, like, going along, and of course, it's like locked down business laptop, so I can't make changes to anything or access a bunch of the, like, w inner Windows settings menus. So you're just like, trying to guess what's going on and then eventually I, I realized he's not using um, my DNS server and he needs to do a DNS lookup and that's why it keeps on failing and why nothing's working and then eventually what I luckily I had a micro tick at hit the customer's location and I was like okay here we'll just nat this over to my DNS server life's good easy peasy lemon squeezy but uh, if I didn't I like last week I had a customer no microtech router because I was trying I'm trying to use cambiums uh, and I couldn't I couldn't hijack their her DNS uh, connections going out so I was kind of up a creek without a paddle without um, um, eventually what we were trying to do was set up a new VPN connection that just already would just had the IP address for the business VPN server but that wasn't working either, so she's kind of just up her creek till I get a micro tick into her house to make it work for her. Otherwise, she just has to use her cell phone provider, her hotspot, because cell phone companies just hijack DNS. FYI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, a um, uh, couple of years ago, um, I had. I had a case where an employee that didn't work anywhere near there here, you know, they worked on the other side of the country. Laptop, um, they didn't know the name and password to get into the laptop. And so, trying to think of how to say, like, well, how can I fix that? Like, I don't know what the admin password is. So, here, you know, I mailed you the CD. Like the uh, Microsoft, uh, I forget what it's called now, Dart, Dart disk, and steps to walk through how to reset the admin password. They couldn't figure it out, even with screenshots. Um, so I thought, well, you know, how do I solve this in the future? Um, and I was looking to see, I'm like, surely you can just start a VPN uh, with the system. And as long as it has internet, it phones home, and then now it's on the domain, and then now I can get in. 
Well, as it turns out, before Windows 10, Microsoft <laughs> had no native way of doing that. You had to run another command that would force a VPN connection up. Uh, and it worked. Um, Windows 10, they built it in. Great. You know, so that at the login screen, if you want, you can be logged into your VPN. Um, but I believe the other side of the VPN has to be a Windows uh, Server 2016 or 2019. And I'm like, God dang it. <laughs> it's like, I don't, I don't want that. I want it to be a microtech. I don't... I, I don't want my Windows server to be sitting on the internet um, waiting for randos to connect to it. Uh, so I've I've had to keep with the non-native methods, but uh, uh, yeah, it's definitely definitely VPNs are a problem. Yeah, yeah. So everybody's gonna be running into it. I'm sure there's a lot of people googling for VPN stuff right at the moment. But, yeah. It, uh, I think half this podcast we just talk about what we saw on Nanog. Uh, Nanog was talking about this, and I uh, saw a a, uh, uh, a couple guys say that just within the past six months they moved anything they would need into a web-based session of some kind, um, eliminating their need for VPNs. Everything was just on the internet, you know, it was behind a, you know, a walled garden of some kind, you know, you had to log in to get to it, but, um, I was like, well, that's... Lucky timing. It, uh, yeah, you know, A, lucky, but B, yeah, that's probably where things are going, and probably, you know, will, or, you know, in 10 years, will VPNs still be a thing? I mean, there's always gonna be legacy stuff, but as far as day to day, most people still have a need for a VPN yeah. in ten years. I still like VPN when I'm traveling, just for uh, anonymity. You know, just to traffic or send all my stuff through to some secure location and then pop out. So I, I think it'll still exist in that fashion. Um. Yeah. Management, remote management stuff, definitely. Like, I don't want to have to set up a secure management system that all of my device network devices will uh, use and behave to according to and then just and then trust on that to work for you know public management so that I can access my network if I'm not in my network um, but for like just general business work stuff yeah totally I don't it's there's just probably some level of that. I, I agree with you. I think the VPN might be might have a number of days ahead of it. <laughs> yeah, like you know, something like Citrix or something like that that just captures whatever application you have in the background and pops it to you over either a web session or some special client. Um, you know, for for a standard business customer, yeah, you know, then you don't have all these nightmares of you know how do I scale my VPN concentrator to you know handle this you don't it has management traffic and that's it yeah. moving on <laughs> so um, like kind of like what you would you say is something like what the US government for like their laptops you're just logging into a desktop in that's hosted somewhere in a government server complex I've got a few customers who do that, and it's like this crazy, ridiculous, long process to log in, but I'm sure you can make that better. But basically something like that, you're just logging into a remote desktop, and you just have a little terminal. Is what you think? But, uh, well, like yeah. that, or it's just web-based. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, you know, you know, take whatever old crappy application you have and, you know, run it through... Uh, a web interface. <laughs> I see, yeah, uh, I see. Tommy appreciates my uh, candor. <laughs> yeah, because old, being an old and crappy web inter or uh, old crappy interface put on the web is going to make it infinitely better. <laughs> it, uh, it. Uh, I mean, you know, government stuff will lag because it always does. Uh, I think. 
Illinois still has like 74 different financial systems because they're all on old separate servers and nobody has any money to make one new one so they just keep spending money on old but anyway but uh but you know most but you know most most business applications will be you know well like you know, quickbooks you know they made quickbooks online instead of regular quickbooks and they're pushing people to that so you know over time it'll just all move to to web based and then they'll get a new UI better or worse <laughs> I think it's a natural progression of things. We're seeing a lot of stuff like, um, I mean, I I don't use, so for Gmail, I don't use a physical client. I always just use the web interface. I've gotten so accustomed to it. And then uh, look at the data center, SharePoint, right? So it's basically just, we only used it for pretty much a file dump back and forth. Um, you know, so that's kind of just a version of Dropbox. If you don't want to pay somebody for a, a hosted version of it, you just sort of do that stuff. You know, with Office 365, all that stuff's moving there. So it seems like most companies can do that stuff. And then, like Mike said, if you need uh, access to an application, Citrix allows you to have a link on your desktop. You double click it and it's actually opening your remote session, but it just looks like you're running the app on your desktop. You don't really know that it's hosted somewhere else. So, I don't know. It seems like the natural natural move i mean there's still going to be some stuff that makes sense to keep in a data center maybe behind a vpn like uh, we've seen some guys that do in the petroleum industry seismic stuff you know so they'll pull in just a ton of data and then they have these a uh, couple of racks of supercomputers that crunch the hell out of that stuff and spit out reports and you know does all that magic so you're still need access to that some um, like mike said some legacy applications but then again citrix can sometimes um cover the front of that to make it a little bit cleaner um i don't know that we like there's some research scientists that do stuff here and they have a lot of weird funky applications you know they have access to like you said tommy a lot of really super secure information that you want to add as many layers of complexity to get to as possible you know it's um I guess sometimes people will go for the lowest hanging fruit, right? So long as you have one extra layer of protection that somebody else doesn't, that's a pain in the butt, then, you know, maybe they'll mess with somebody else's stuff instead of yours. I don't know. But I do. That's always the hope. Yeah. <laughs> Just make it a little bit less convenient. <laughs> uh, let's see. So I had had, uh, I don't know, I've had some time to think here lately. You know, we're all trapped in our houses. Uh, or should be if you're doing it right. <laughs> Not this guy. Essential. Employee. I'm essential. You're essential. Yeah. I'm technically essential. First too. person in the. Yeah. Apparently, the this is the first time anyone in the world has said that I am essential to them, and it was the U.S. I government. Saw, uh, I saw um, a meme I liked online. It was Mori Povich looking at a card, and he goes, uh, "Your employer says you're essential. Um, your paycheck proves that to be a lie." <laughs> 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 uh, another meme was um, uh, the the government says that you are essential, and uh, the another little line this piece of paper that says uh, uh, the hooker says that you're her favorite, and then the the person below it says, uh, but those are the same thing. They mean the exact same thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I saw one yes. that was like uh, Ryan Gosling making this weird face, like, don't talk to me. And it said, the look I give non-essentials when they try and talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, good times. Aren't you supposed to be home? <laughs> uh, uh, beautiful lines. Oh, Facebook is so full of that. I So full, like, you know, on these, like, these local townie groups, like, you know, it's just, you know, people who have just a whole bunch of cans of the world taking pictures, you know, I just see too many cars driving down my street. Why isn't everybody at home? Well, apparently your neighbors work. Well, I don't know. It's <laughs> like we drive by a park and there's kids all over the play equipment on the swings. And it's like, dude, come on. I mean, you know, it's like at least make a passing attempt at this. This is ridiculous, but I'm not here to debate that stuff. Where I was going with this is that, uh, you know, I was cleaning out, obviously, a uh, lot of stuff 
uh, and I'm still I'm on the tail end of cleaning out my my closet here. I basically had to clean just the space you see here, and my wife like floor to ceiling cleaned the entire rest of the house in like four days, and I'm still I'm still at this. But um, I found my old CCIE book that I got uh, that I I mean I I went through that joke. I mean it took me like nine months start to finish to get the CCIE written like to actually pass it. And I had like a pack of extra material that I had stuck in there that was like three quarters of an inch thick. Uh, but I realized how long ago it was that I passed that. And it was uh, like nine years ago. So it's uh, I'm not a CCIE candidate anymore. <laughs> it was so long ago, you know. I was thinking, why am I hanging on to this? I guess it was, I felt like I had uh, I had earned, I earned it. That was like the hardest single thing I think I'd ever had to like, do on my own and uh, I guess I was keeping it as some kind of a trophy some monument to uh, to uh, to to my uh, moral fortitude but then I noticed also that it was buried in the back of a closet and I didn't even realize I was there so I, uh, I tossed that joker in the recycle bin and man away it went I was do you guys hang on to uh, to stuff like that like uh, trophies of past victories Heads of your yeah, enemies. You, oh God, you know, <laughs> no! I'm not even gonna unblur the background because you, you just all the shit. I'm a, I, I will forever remember. We were moving, and some of my cousins were helping us. My brother and I pack up, and there was just years and years of crap piled up underneath our beds. And so it was like we uh, were like move the beds and we're just shoving stuff into bags or boxes or just in the trash and I remember my cousin she was arguing with her mom about helping us and continuing her mom was like you have to help because they're family blah 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 and she she just says but mom they're pack rats <laughs> and uh, I, I bless her heart she was so right even as like a ten year old child, like God, I I'm horrible about it, and I'm always like every few months I'll have a like little spurt where I'll throw a bag worth of stuff away, and then I feel bad about having done that and won't do anymore. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's just terrible. Yeah, I don't know, man. I threw away a ton, and there was a couple of things where I like, uh, like my hand kind of hesitated in the air when I was getting ready to throw away. I was like, ah. Eh. I was like, dude, I didn't even know this was in here. You know, I haven't seen it in years. Get rid of it. And my wife actually went through and picked out a couple of things <laughs> and and hung on to them. But um, I don't know. It's so funny. Like, I just I was going through that stuff and I was looking and I was like, I just don't care about this stuff. And I'm never going to use it. And anything that it that was actually salvageable, I tried to find it a new home if I could. Um which is weird because you're not really supposed to do that right now. I don't know. I guess they could disinfect the stuff. It's, you know, whatever. Um, but, yeah, like, I I don't know, man. All this stuff, it's 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 good, right? So it kind of, it's giving me perspective, giving me kind of a, a new look on things. It's like if I go outside. It's so funny because the birds are finally starting to come back, you know, and I'm, I'm hearing them sing and stuff like that, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's reassuring in a way, you know, it's like the world is still out there. The earth is still turning. We still all exist and we're still going to exist tomorrow and everything's going to be all right. I just, uh, you know, it helps me reevaluate kind of what's important. And I like that. And, uh, perspective is good for people. And a lot of people don't get it until something major happens in their life. And I hope this helps a lot of people find that one way or the other. Hmm. Well, to give you a perspective of some of the crap I've, I've built up, I have here the Encyclopedia of Electrical Circuits, uh, Volume 7. I bought this um, 15 years plus, more more than that, years ago. And um, I think I probably opened it up a couple times and played around with some of the circle, circuit stuff. And um, now it just sits on my desk. Um $40, just, oof. Yeah, if anybody wants it, hook me, 
you know, just send me a message. I will send it to you. It's I'm never going to do electrical circuits again. It's just the last book. Ugh. The last book I maintain because uh, I don't have any other books. I used to get certification books, and now I just do like the PDF version. So I, I don't even keep real books. But it's up there on the shelf. Let's see if you could see it uh, right there. It's Magnificent Desolation. It's uh, Buzz Aldrin's like. Um, uh, what do you call that biography? Yeah, and so he somebody got it for me. It's actually a signed copy, so I've got Buzz Aldrin's signature in that thing. I think that's super cool. Nice. So I'm hanging on to that one, but it's like, I right, man, I'm just not. I don't need books. I go through them and then I'm done with them. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna destroy the environment with those books anymore. I'm done with that. I'm purging. Mm. I'm purging. I'm letting it all go. I've threw away probably 200 pounds of stuff. Well, maybe more. I had a bunch of old switches and stuff like that I got rid of. But I feel better. I feel lighter. I don't know about you guys. Good. Good for you. That is a good thing to do. <laughs> um, let's see here. What other fun stuff was showing up? Do you have any other notes? Mm. We're at about an hour 20, so it's usually about the time we stick a fork in it. You have any final thoughts? Uh, I got my, my, my plea out into the world. Uh, so please, people, please, please don't use internal DNS servers to something that's not going to stay internal. <laughs> Good times. Or I've seen before where you put one internal DNS server and one external, right? And then send it. That would <laughs> be great. Beautiful, perfect. <laughs> so, but don't use two private IP addresses. Or or this was the other customer. They It was a public IP address, but it wouldn't respond to anything outside of their network. Awesome. I was like, what the? My good, great, beautiful security genius just sucks for me right now because it makes me re look really, really bad. So, <laughs> it, 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 uh, I've seen it. Uh, I've seen where um, th uh, there was a uh, there were some um, uh, remote offices and they they put public DNS servers uh, in the DHCP options. Because if the VPN went down, then at least people could still do something. Except then that meant that they could n never access any internal resource. <laughs> so then they decided to put one of each. So that you would randomly get an internal resource and <laughs> randomly not. <laughs> Good times. So, uh, so then I did statically set everything because I couldn't control the uh, little Juniper box. I then just statically set every device in there, well, every PC in there to use the internal because they couldn't access Active Directory. They couldn't sign in. They couldn't do anything. Hmm. Excellent. But I think it was mostly desktops. I don't think there were any laptops. All right. If you take your desktop home, that's 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 a different story. So let's put a bow on it. I'm gonna leave one last thought, yep. and that is Master Pancake is doing a live stream of Wrath of Khan tonight. I think at 9:30 Central on Twitch. So if you guys haven't checked him out, you should check him out. It'd be a lot of fun. Although I'm not gonna put this out before then, so I don't even know why I bothered to say it. But definitely check out Master Pancake. They've been doing a lot of live streams, so it's uh, helps them out. Uh, if you can throw them a couple bones, because they're I mean it's, they're performers, you know, just like the bus boys and the, the waiters and you know, those people that are having problems, you know, making ends meet at the moment. So help those performers if you can. So I will say, uh, Mikey, if people want to get a hold of you out on the internet, how are they going to go about that? No, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. I, uh, I should have some help starting on Monday, but then I also had to fire a guy on Thursday. So I don't know if I'm really getting, anything that's right he insulted your haircut right had to let him go immediately it, uh, yeah. yeah such is life it, well you know it helps when you're an employee if you do something uh and he didn't huh. so cool well that's never stopped me before so <laughs> 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 it's gotta be better at hiding it 
Uh, the, the key is not doing things at a partic- at a slow enough rate where you can't get fired. Uh, he obviously was too slow. Uh, well, such is life. Yeah, that's the thing that everybody else in the, in the company has figured out. <laughs> <laughs> How slow they can go and s- not be fired. Uh, well, it sounds like a fun contest. I'll try it sometime. Uh, <laughs> Tommy, if you want people to find you out on the internet, how do they go about that? Um, well, traditionally it's been, um, the brothers with slapped slack, uh, slash mattermost, I guess now it will be. Um, but I actually, uh, I've been doing contract work and so I decided that I needed to get a company and so I have a company and I have a website now and it's junk right now, but, um, junkrightnow.com. you, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> lostcreek.tech. Um, is the website and eventually I'll have all that filled out and stuff and you know by the uh, I'm hoping to spend some time t- on it this weekend and make make it somewhat decent and then finish up I have some articles I was writing on uh, um, some of the stupid shit I've done like um, going full EG- EBGP uh, in my network um, so each of my towers are, are uh, full just running BGP between them and their co- the core, whatever else they're connected to. And I didn't want to do IBGP because then I would either have to do route reflectors or have to have all my routers connected to each other, which sounded like a huge pain in the ass. So I was like, oh, I'll just run, the inter- run it like the internet runs it. So uh, going through how horrible of an idea that was <laughs> and converting it from where, where we were, which was a statically routed idea or network, and the silliness involved with that. So it was fun. It was a huge project. And uh, I think there's some information there that people might be able to use. Looking forward to reading about it. Uh, Do you have an email on the new domain? Uh, no, not yet. Um, Slacker. But you, there will be an email address that you can reach me at on that website. So eventually I'll deal it, with it. it uh, so you said that the new website is junk. It's not somebody's junk, right? There's not just a picture of someone's junk on there. Uh, no, that's the that's a default um, default theme from WordPress. Okay. <laughs> so excellent. I should I should get some uh, uh, junior high humor injected in your <laughs> oh, sure. up. All right. So if you guys <laughs> want to find me, it's Greg at Gregshole dot com or. Uh, you can find me at my blog, gregsoul.com. You can really easily find me at Slack, or I guess, Matter Most now, as uh, Tommy said. Uh, really, that's probably the easiest way to get a hold of me, honestly. Um, I'm so much more responsive on there. I uh, I just call you. Yeah, well, yeah there's that, too. Uh, just calls me to say <laughs> hi now, that Mikey guy. Uh, but, yeah, uh, also, if you want to get access to the patron-only Slack or patron-only Matter Most, whichever one happens <coughs> to be in existence when you join that's patreon.com forward slash your brother's wisp and uh any questions comments please shoot them towards us thank you guys for listening and um honestly thank you guys for being part of the community it's a really weird time the whole idea of self-isolation uh is bizarre to most people but to be honest with you i've been on an island for a really long time you guys are my um you're my anchor to other humans so uh, I don't know. I've already had my uh, my community put together for a while, so uh, if this can be part of your community, keep you sane. Please jump in. Thank you guys, and uh, talk to you soon. Yeah. I'm telling you, you don't know what you are missing. Ideas and some good comedy given. If you missed the show already, don't worry, you're forgiven.